Welcome Good morning, to Capital Paul. Discussions. Oh, welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nunnemaker with our guests, Paul Demers and Dan Harvey and Jim Riggio are joining us. But before we get started, a quick disclaimer or disclosure, the Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And again, this is for educational purposes only. So with that out of the way, uh, Paul, let me give you the presenter role. There we go. And while we're doing that, uh, welcome, Paul. Uh, is this the first time you've done a presentation on the roundtable? Yes, I believe it is. I think it is, too. And uh, you're a well-known figure in Trading Group 2, but uh, for those who haven't uh, watched the Trading Group 2 meetings, uh, Paul's a longtime friend, good trader, and uh, he's been trading this Jeep and developed it with Jim after Dan came up with the Weird Ore. So it's kind of an evolutionary trade, but... Uh, Welcome, uh, Paul, and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. So we'll start. Here's the beginning slide. Let's go right into the background. <clears throat> the Weirdo and the Jeep are basically uh, the same trade. The, the difference is the adjustment rules. Uh, both of them uh, designed in 2010. The Weird Ore was originally designed by Dan Harvey, and then Jim and I uh, designed and developed the Jeep. The differences were the Jeep was, I needed a, a trade that I could manage with uh, contingent orders because I was not able to be in front of the screen in the beginning. Um, at the time, it was designed for the rut. Um, I had made numerous attempts to trade it in the SPX, but was unsuccessful, and eventually I abandoned trying to use the SPX. Both the Weirdor and the Jeep had an edge in positive expectancy uh, in the beginning, and right through 2013. And in 2014, the option markets really changed uh, the dynamics. And They've gone through a fundamental transformation during that time. Uh, the distribution of single and multi-day returns have changed. Uh, Jim presented the uh, distribution of returns, and I suggest watching that. You'll get a better understanding. Uh, the speed of the markets, the IV, the SKU, and the term structure have all changed. So the dynamics of the, the cheap were, did not work under those conditions. You know, pre-2014 was a fundamentally different market as compared today due to the growth in HFT and algo trading. Uh, the things have radically changed in both the equity and options markets. The old option strategies have lost much of their edge. There's a lower expectancy, which turns into lower profits and or higher risks. And you know all these new option strat trading strategies need to adapt or they'll fail. When the markets changed in 2012 to 2014, there were modifications made to both the Jeep and the Weirdor adjustment strategies, but the edge was lost. At that time, there was not enough market data available to understand these new market characteristics. And in 2014, Dan Harvey, Jim Riggio, and I adapted our approaches and migrated our strategies to butterfly structures, which now fit the current trading environment. In late 2016, sufficient market data was gathered from the new trading era to properly assess the new markets. And armed with this, I redesigned the Jeep in an adjustment strategy that was customized to fit the SPX for this new environment. So let's look at some charts. Um, this is a theta decay graph, and 
pretty much I think everybody has seen this. This is what gets promoted to trade um, shorter-term DTEs. The only issue is that this is based on at-the-money option theta decay. So it really doesn't reflect what's happening at the tails where the cheap gets traded. So this is a graph of, of the tails and the decay, theta decay in the tails. And you can see it, it works opposite of what the at the money theta does. So you're better out longer term in the DTEs and further away from the money to collect your theta. Oops. Sorry. Uh, and this is basically the trade. Um, I don't know how many people know what it looks like, so I thought I'd put this slide in. So basically, the, it's an um, unbalanced iron condor uh, with a downside hedge below the market. And the unbalanced condor is due to the fact that the call credit spreads are typically a lot closer to the at the money than the put credit spreads and that the market generally goes up. So they get threatened more than the put credit spreads. <clears throat> and the capital requirements for one of these tranches is $18,000. Oh, and I, I put up in the top, Jim came up with the name, the Jeep, because it looks like a Jeep. And we basically named the different pieces of the structure. So we'd be able to have a conversation on the phone and know exactly where the trade was in the marketplace, as you can see from the back window and the roof, windshield hood and front bumper. So when Jim and I discussed the trade, it's, you know, he asked me how far away from you from the windshield. So it does make it a little easier to have a conversation. So the setup is, um, basically, I start the trade between 60 and 93 DTE. Uh, the short strikes are placed between 10 and 12 delta on the credit spreads. And the spread width is between 20 and 25 points, and that's based on market conditions. And also the ratio of put and call credit spreads is based on the market conditions, depending upon some indicators I have what direction I think the market's going uh, will determine how many call credit spreads and put credit spreads that I'll do. Also, I'll add a hedge to the trade at the beginning based on some risk indicators that I use. So most of the time, the trade runs without a downside hedge. Uh, there are occasions when it will get put on in the beginning for protection. And I do tend to trade these in multiple tranches. So if I do, I will scale the trade using weekly expirations. And that helps me keep the trades separated uh, because after I scale in, I manage each tranche separately rather than as a bulk and managing the portfolio as a whole. I found that this uh, has better returns and it's safer. Um, for risk control to manage them individually. <clears throat> and so th the adjustment strategy is, is changed from a very static one to one that looks at um, volatility, uh, put pricing or skew, term structure, velocity of the market are some of the adjustment factors. Uh, the adjustments of simple spreads are single options for ease of ex execution. Going back to the original setup where I would usually do uh, contingent orders, um, I now monitor the components of the Jeep with alerts and the adjustments. If I'm going to be away from the computer, it's uh, fairly easy to set up contingent orders so that I don't don't have to worry about missing an adjustment. <clears throat> the 
uptake of the new adjustment strategy has helped the returns on the upside, which always were a struggle for this trade. Um, and it really doesn't add more downside risk. Um, on the downside adjustments, um, I use both delta and vega corrections to help control the, the risk and the movement on the downside. So here are some back testing results. Um, I back tested it from 2014 through 17. And these results include a 75 cent commission rate, but do not include slippage. Um, because I don't really use these results to predict any yearly returns. I basically view back testing as a means to seeing consistency. You know, I don't want to see big swings in the P&Ls or big drawdowns while I'm in the trade. So you can see that the returns are are pretty good. Um, and they're not, you know, because these, these are back tested, so that doesn't mean that these will be the returns going forward. But you can see they were fairly consistent. So I've got a couple of examples to show, and I picked 2016 because for a couple of reasons. I thought it was um, relevant to today's markets. Um, and I picked both the February expiration and the April expiration. Um, you can see in February the trade low was 197 points below entry. But the overall swing was 269 points from high to low. And the April trade was up 196 points from entry, and it was actually put on at the bottom. So we can get right into a February trade. This is the setup to start the February trade. Um, at, at all, both of these were started at 63 DTE. And as usual, we get hit for an upside adjustment um, on the second day. And then on the 14th day in the trade, the market reversed and were triggered to remove the upside hedge. And that's what the trade looked like. And so now we're going to start going down. So the first downside adjustment happened on the 17th day in the trade, three days later. The oh, can I ask a quick question here? Why, sure. why did you choose? I mean, the thing is that you put it on and it immediately moved against you. Did you pick this one because this was the worst uh, trade that moved up against you, or was it just a, an average bet? Or, you know, give us a feel for of the back testing results. Where did this one fit into how difficult it was to manage? Uh, this was probably the most difficult. I believe this, out of all the back testing, this was one of the few that. Um, had to be adjusted both on the upside and the downside. So you're getting a swing from having to adjust it. You know, it's, it's the typical whipsaw that we were, would get with the Jeep. You know, you have to adjust it in one direction, then you have to adjust it in the other direction. Plus, I wanted to get this. This was one of the biggest movements in the, in the, um, while you were in the trade. Thank you. You're welcome. So this, once I looked at the put pricing structure, it, it dictated using debit spreads versus singles to adjust this. So, you know, here's the first one on 17 days in the trade. Uh, there's the second downside adjustment. You know, and the market's moving down pretty good, and the trade is still in reasonably good shape. Um, and this was the last downside adjustment, which happened 30 days in, into the trade. Um, and at that time, the call spreads were closed. Typically, when they get down 15, 20, 25 cents, I'm looking to take them off, um, worried about a whip you know, the big V bottom move up. And here's where the trade was closed. Um, 
profit was 425.50 after commissions. This is also back tested, so it may have been less with slippage. Um, although it's undetermined how how slippage can affect the trade, so I never include them in commissions and in the P and Ls when I'm testing. And so here's a graph showing the time in the trade and all of the adjustments. And you can see that, that you know, the trade initiation, we had our first adjustment to the upside. We closed the adjustment for the upside here. And then these are the three downside adjustments. And, you know, as usual, I put on the fi final adjustment. The market does this to us all the time, right at the bottom. And then this was at the end of the trade. And all of these, both of these trades were taken off at 21 DTE. And that was the back testing plan to just hold them from 63 to 21 DTE. So that trade worked out really well. Um, so let's go to the April trade that ran up. <clears throat> Same setup, uh, 63 DTE. And right at the beginning of the trade. It was two days, three days into the trade. We needed also needed an upside adjustment. This time, we don't get triggered to close it. The second adjustment was also an upside adjustment. I'm looking to keep the deltas flat to positive. You can see here that delta was 0.75 positive after the adjustment. And it, this is pretty simple on typically at 35, 38 DTE, um, I look to roll the trade up. And that's what happened here. Just rolled the whole trade up and basically made a brand new trade out of it. We rolled the calls, sold the long call, which helped offset the losses in the call credit spreads. The put credit spreads had lost almost all of their money, so we rolled them up to gain some more theta in the trade. And then the market cooperated and you know, traded in a range that didn't need any more adjustments and was closed for 883.50. And here is a graph of the adjustments. So you can see it, you know, up 196 points from entry is pretty tough trading. So I was very happy with how um, the trade turned out on the upside. I'm much more confident that the trade can now make money when the market's moving up. And I think... Tom, if I don't know if you want to copy this URL into the chat. So oh, yeah, I can you, paste it in there. If you'd like to follow along, here's a URL where you could all sign up. And right now you're anticipating that will go through late July. Correct. If, if, uh, I'll probably start at the end of this month. I'll be putting some content in there early. And that's it. We just have questions. Paul, um, this is Jim. A um, few questions. Uh, you, you and I have talked about this. Dan and I have talked about it also. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the reasons about why you stopped trading the Jeep? Paul and I, I'm sorry, Dan and I can end up adding to it. We can end up telling you why we end up stopping. But, but why did, what, what were the reasons that you ended up stopping? And when you went back, okay, uh, after you got enough data, um, um, can you tell us, you know, what ended up changing. For, for those of you who don't know what I mean by, by enough data, the, the, the study that, that Paul was referring to is that um, 
What we found, and I did this research with EAB Investment uh, Group, uh, what we found was that the distribution of returns after program uh, or high frequency trading started in the algos is that the distributions on a daily basis didn't end up seeming to be as wide, meaning the distribution mm -hmm. of returns. If you take a look at the standard bell curve of how um, stocks or how the S&P or RUT has moved up and down on a daily basis, uh, more times than before you had a very, very small change. Uh, so if you think about the bell curve where you had the distributions of, of the returns of, you know, the days that it was down and by how many percent and you mapped it out on a big bell curve, what you would find is that after uh, the U.S. Fed and central banks around the world started their um, quantitative easing programs, after Dodd-Frank ended up uh, causing a lot of the banks to have less uh, leverage, which ended up uh, in in turn, causing more um, margin requirement for, for everybody, right, for hedge funds, for you, for myself, for everybody. Um, what ended up happening is we didn't get quite the same distribution of returns. So, Paul, given that, um, once you've got that, uh, you know, new data, okay, and I know that you look at this all the time, um, what what changed in your risk management of the old uh, weird or uh, the way Dan ended up uh, uh, managing it or the way uh, we managed the cheap? Well, the difference, uh, I'll speak to the differences in the Jeep because I'm not exactly sure how Dan ended up changing to manage the weird or. But the, what I found that's happening now to make the changes is I actually make my downside adjustments sooner, which has helped the trade. And you would think that, you know, by making a downside adjustment sooner, you're taking money out of the trade and it, it hurts the performance. And while that is the case, um, you are also adjusting much cheaper. So you get that first adjustment under your belt uh, while it's very inexpensive, because typically in my the first unless the the you know SKUs and IVs dictate a debit spread, typically the first downside adjustment is a long put. So I want to buy that really really inexpensively, and the longer I waited, as I was testing it, the longer I waited, it became pay the same price, the either the put was much further away from the money, or I had to pay a lot more money for it, which actually, when the market reversed, hurt the trade worse. So it was kind of counterintuitive that I'm, I'm much more aggressive on the downside now. Um, and that helps the performance, as you could see on the downside to be able to manage the trade with, you know, having low drawdowns. I could definitely uh, yep. see that. I'm sorry, but before you leave the downside, because on the downside, what I remember, some of the biggest uh, battle scars that we had was not just because of the Delta, when we got thrown out of the back window of the Jeep, um, but um, a good chunk of our injuries were sustained from the increase in Vega. Um, you talked about how you're using mm -hmm. that now in adjustment, and, and adjusting earlier, I can see, is definitely the solution. Um, but how do you end up triggering um, when your Vega, how do you end up adjusting before Vega hurts you too badly, I guess, at the bottom line? Uh, it, if I found that if as long as the volatility is low, that the long, actually when you buy the long put, the um, you're cutting your vega. It's the it's the fastest and most predictable way of cutting vega is just buying a long put. The problem that we've always had is that we end up as the market goes down, the volatility spikes up, and the price of the puts get much higher. So you and then when it reverses, you lose all that money. So by doing it early, I'm cutting the vega out of the position while it's still low, 
the, the volatility is still low. And that helps um, the position going forward because the, the Vega will get positive much quicker. And it hasn't cost you a lot of money to make that adjustment. That makes a lot of sense. D Dan, um, any thoughts or comments or questions about that? Uh, well, no, actually, uh, Paul, that was an excellent uh, presentation. I really like the way that you morphed uh, the old uh, rut weird or Jeep into uh, the current setup that, that you have. Uh, I just would comment uh, regarding what uh, Jim said about uh, the distribution uh, uh, curve, the payoff curve, uh, becoming a little more leptokurtotic, meaning if you think of a bell curve, uh, tall and skinny near the mean or or, or uh, median price as opposed to uh, to platy kurtotic which is broad and flat so uh, the payoff distribution curve i noticed when i was doing the rut weird or uh, became a little more leptokurtotic but of course the actual log normal distribution of the prices of the underlying stayed about the same in other words you still had roughly the same potential of having a fat tail, or I guess I should say the fat, the, the fat tail distributions were about the same. So in other words, to simplify that, you're not getting as much uh, bang for the buck. In other words, the risk that you're willing to take, I found I was not getting enough. And uh, I, I, you know, had looked at the trading uh, 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 the SPX uh, weird or but this was about the time that we were moving to our current location so I didn't do that and then I got involved in a few other things some outside ventures and I started to begin to look at uh, the butterfly structure again and of course you know, wound up with the road trip trade but I like the way that that you have evolved this, and I would certainly agree that you have to nip this in the bud when things start to go south, and you have to do it before it costs you so much that you begin to take away the money from your potential returns, because you know, obviously the ultimate goal in this is to have a positive expected return. and. And like we've all talked about before, uh, there are basically, uh, well, maybe zero, but maybe only one or two uh, uh, types of setups for trading options that um, that will be profitable just on the basis of probability alone. Meaning, if you never make any adjustments and you never set any stops. Uh, basically, uh, the casino wins. Uh, nothing is set up for the trader to win. And the way that, that we do win is risk management and uh, timely adjustments. And I like the way that, that you showed, um, you know, in your presentation that, um, that you're going to have to work this trade to uh, basically pound it into submission when things start to go bad. So, so all in all, uh, I think this is now a very robust strategy, and I have to congratulate you for the way that you uh, morphed this. Uh, it it's really looks good now. So that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Brad. How much difference do you think trading SPX instead of the RUT makes? Um, I I haven't gone. In, I first started looking at the RUT. What bothered me with the RUT was how extreme the moves could be, um, you know, especially you know there was a one day it was up over two percent in one day. So it. it you know, I always been. I stopped trading the RUT a long time ago, so I focused on the SPX for this trade, but I'm sure that with some modifications, um, 
you could do this in the in the rut as well. And I may spend some time with the rut and see if I can come up with a new strategy for it that worked better than the original G. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. So delta limits. The upside is a price limit um, on the credit spreads. Um, downside uses a delta of the position in, depending upon what the market conditions are. I tend to keep it pretty tight. Uh, it's anywhere from 7 to 12 delta on the downside is an adjustment point. Do you readjust the do I do I readjust the credit spreads when the shorts hit a certain delta? Actually, the credit spreads. One of the things I found in the testing from even doing the at the end of the original Jeep was the um, I usually will kind of morph the call credit spreads into some type of butterfly-ish structure rather than take them off. Most of the time, you need your, you know, the calls will get hit in the beginning. You, you take them off, you roll them up. Uh, the market goes back down. So my the initial Jeep was to close the calls, and I would not roll them up. So that limited the profit on the trade, and I found that converting the credit spreads into a that butterfly structure and taking it off if the market didn't continue up would uh, actually create more profit in the trade. Yeah, I was I was very pleased with that. Um and I didn't show the August 2015 trade for a reason. It it the vols were so low when the first downside adjustment got hit, buying the put uh, and buying a couple of debit spreads at the bottom. The profit was very high, and I thought that was I thought that this using this February trade was much more realistic uh, that you could because it didn't quite work like that well. I thought that might be too an extreme result. But the August 15, it, that's usually where I start when I'm looking at a strategy is playing around that August 15 date. So, so Paul, I mean, that, that's a really, really important statement. You didn't use the most difficult month that we faced in the last decade because, uh, well, maybe not, yeah, I guess almost a decade, let's call it last eight years, because your profits were too high. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Which I think is kind of like an amazing statement. Most people that have shown, you know, started with that one. It's amazing that you needed to, you, know, you only ended up revealing that if somebody asked you. Um, but, but the second thing is that, um, that makes tremendous amount of sense when you end up buying a put if you start out when the IVs are low. And if you're going to end up buying a put and then the market drops, okay, you're going to end up always doing great. But what happens if the IVs are already very high and the put skew is steep and buying the puts? It's just way too expensive. Is there an alternative uh, adjustment that you would end up using, or um, how, how would you end up handling that situation? I'm thinking about the things that, that, and Dan probably beat you up too. I'm thinking about the trades that beat me up the most if I didn't do something, and, and that, sure. that's another one. How, how did you handle that? Well, typically, it, if if the volatility is high-ish, where what I, one thing I look for is um, I have a a delta that I want to, you know, fix. So I'm looking at a put that's going to help flatten the position deltas out. And one of the problems, the differences between the SPX and the RUT is, you know, if you're dealing with a six, five, six, seven, eight delta put, you're a long way from the money. And 
when the vols are lower, you're much closer to the money, so it will have a much better effect on protecting the trade. You know, if the vols are already up, it, it's, you're going to be so far below the money buying that put that it's not going to be as effective. So I'll turn around and build a uh, put debit spread structure and look at this, the, the SKUs and the pricing and place it to get me that delta fix and help cut some of the temporary vega down um, instead of buying that put that I don't think is going to really work. Yeah. I don't know if everybody realizes just how how critically important what you just said um, is. So if IV is low, you're going to end up buying the put because then if it ends up expanding dramatically, you're going to end up making a ton of money on the delta, gamma, and the vega for, for that uh, put that you bought. But if IV is already um, higher and what happens today, what didn't happen, uh, I don't think, nearly as much, uh, you know, uh, um, when Dan and I were trading this all the time, is that if IV is high and put skew is steep, uh, buying that, that put is just way too expensive. But if put skew is steep, that means you're buying in a put with an IV that's lower and selling one that is much higher. So now if it does move against you, um, you're not going to lose nearly as much money a a as we would have, okay, if we just would have bought that put. Right. Plus the the retention of the the you know the, what I did notice was depending upon where you started that debit spread that when the market did reverse that you lost you kept most of the you know much more of the profits in that debit spread than you would in the single especially buying oh. it later in the in the adjustment. Without question, if a, and I don't know if people have the, you know, you know, if they've done this, if they have the experience, but if you end up, okay, buying the put after it starts to end up going down, and then the market ends up reversing, that put gets absolutely slaughtered. You lose delta, you lose gamma, and most importantly, you lose your vega. So, so it just gets crushed when it rebounds against you, where a put, a vertical, depending on where you put it in the lane, it's going to, it really doesn't matter. It's always going to lose less, but it can lose significantly less if you end up putting on the hedge when it's going down or, and then it bounces back up. You'll keep so much more of your profit that you have in, in that hedge uh, than if you just have the single long. If you have the single long, your timing has to be absolutely perfect. And people who end up uh, always doing the back testing, saying, "Well, if I got in here and I got out there, yeah, that wouldn't happen in real life." So, so I, I think the concept of, you know, using the right tool for the job—when to use a, a single put, when to use a put vertical—is um, uh, absolutely key to hedging that downside. Right. That's what I found in, in, you know. As you're back testing, it's like, okay, the put's made a lot of money, the trade is up, you're out by the back window, or you're out the back. Now, what do you do? You know, that put hedge has made all the money to keep the, the trade alive. And if you take it off, you're going to be exposed to some severe changes in your P&L because now you have no more protection if it continues down. You know, the timing of of fixing that structure when you're out the back of the tent and you you actually will good chance you'll have a, a positive p and l of trying to to figure out what to do to save that p and l and a lot of times you know the the original argument i would make is you take the trade off and that's all well and good if, if they're trading you know if You've gone out the back window on a 60-point down move in the SPX. You know, are they going to be trading? Will you be able to close it? So one of the things that I've changed how I do it is so that it will survive that move and you can work on the trade the next day when typically the market bounces up and they're more apt to trade and you can close it without ending up giving up all that profit from the long puts. 
And Paul, one of the things too is that when it rebounds, do you remember we did a lot of studies about, uh, can you end up sharing what, what you remember about the study where we did about when did the largest single day uh, up days occur? Yeah, well, they're always in a bear market. You know, it, it's the rebound from, a, you know, it's a V bottom. Or once the correction is over, uh, everybody rushes in to buy the dip. And so the largest, historically, the largest up moves are in a bear market or a severe correction. So you do have to worry about that up move. Now, the other thing that happens, I didn't show it in, in the two adjustments, uh, the two trades, but in the August 15, you know, uh, I showed where I rolled the trade up in the April expiration. But in the August 15, when you get down to the middle or the back of the tent, um, I now roll the trade down right away. Um, and that has made a big difference in retaining any profits you have and or not seeing big losses once the balls come out. Well, I would agree with with all the comments from uh, Paul and Jim. I think that the, uh, that the timely use of a debit spread is perhaps the single best tool in the toolkit. Uh, and... Uh, as Paul was uh, saying, when you have a V bottom, if if you spend a lot of money to simply buy an extra long put, which which you know admittedly uh, can flatten your de your deltas out, but once that reversal starts, the premium is just going to bleed from that long put, and and you're toast, and you've taken away all the potential uh, profit that uh, that that the core strategy had. So uh, using a debit spread is very important. And when you have to add one, I think it's important to, to either uh, maintain a spreadsheet or a logbook or something, know the price that you paid for that and decide in advance the maximum loss that you're willing to take on that debit spread when you have a rebound. And you have to do this, um, you know, in accordance with uh, the expected return of the basic trade structure itself. In other words, if if you're only looking now to make $500, you know, if everything worked out perfectly, you don't want to lose more than $500, obviously, on the debit spread. Sounds like you speak from experience. Uh, you think you think possibly that this might have happened to me? <laughs> you know, you know one of the I think we're I'm all in that club. Of, one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that Dan and I have been trading so long that that for a lot of the newer uh, traders, Dan and I have lost money in new and innovative ways that you guys haven't even thought about yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gaining in that club. Uh, maybe next year I'll be allowed in it. Sad but true. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. it is. <laughs> now, one one of the things I do with contingent orders, I don't do spreads with contingent orders. If I'm going to be away from the computer, I will buy a put. I will, you know, if I decide I'm worried about the downside hitting an adjustment point, I will set up a contingent order to buy the put as a temporary fix. And then when I'm able to get at the screen, change it to the, the debit spread. But I, I feel much more confident with these contingent orders that I do that the singles will fill um, much easier than trying to fill a spread. Well, the operative word there would be uh, that, it, that it's a temporary thing. Uh, yes. Just like you said, once you get back, you have to to either convert that to a debit spread or or else just immediately take it off for a very small loss. Because remember, uh, as Paul and Jim pointed out, we are weighing everything against uh, the potential expected return of the uh, trade. And I know when I used to uh, be a mentor, uh, my 
uh, some of my students would show me a graph. It might be a butterfly. It might be a condor. And uh, poking above the zero line for maybe $100, whatever it was, you know, calendar or, or butterfly or condor, and the student would say, well, yeah, but, but see if I – but see, if I simply hold this, see, I can still make $100. But in the real world, that's just not going to happen. That's just going to be a losing trade. So you have to take it off and be done with it. So the same thing applies here in a sense. You have to be very realistic about what your expected return is going to be from this particular trade. And from that point on, every decision you make needs to be in accordance with with what you expect to make realistically. And once you reach a point where, you know, realistically you're not going to make any money or not make much money, then uh, for me anyway, my entire mindset will change. Right. I agree. And you also look at how much your potential you could lose. You know, so if you're going to make a hundred dollars and you have $17,000 at risk, um, you know, you have to, that has to come factor into the decision to um, just close the trade and move to the next one. What ends up happening is that there's almost like a switch in my brain that gets flipped from trying to make money to going into capital conservation mode. Okay, um, because you know we're all going to lose trades. It it happens to everybody. Uh, the key is that that you, you need n to know when to say uncle uh, fast enough, uh, so that now what you're doing is that you're protecting yourself. Because we can all recover from you know a two, three, four, five percent loss. It's a lot harder to end up recovering from a sixty or seventy percent loss. That's correct. Plus, if, you know, and that's one of the things with backtesting uh, and manual backtesting that I, that's why I do, I prefer manual backtesting so that I can see how the trade is performing day to day or now, you know, down to five minutes. So I was um, able to see, you know, how bad the trade got as, as it went along and, you know, when it won't come back. Um, you know, you get to a point where, Okay, if if the trade is down X amount of dollars, statistically, I never make any money. The trade, you know, the back testing on the trade says, you know, once you get down beyond this level, it it doesn't make any money. So now, you know, I agree, Jim. You you put on your capital preservation hat. Now you're looking to try and get out for as little loss as you can. And I I think you know in the beginning, you know, I get taught that you put the trade on and you kind of married to the trade and you can adjust it and, and fix it and fiddle with it and have, you know, make money with it. The reality is there are times when it's, this trade is done. It's not going to work. The, the adjust, the risk you're going to take trying to save it is far greater than what your potential returns from that point going forward are. Let's see, John asked, do I buy a put at the market? Um, if uh, I'm assuming as an, uh, you, you mean as an adjustment. The, I typically have, have looked at the trade the day before and kind of made my next day plan uh, before the, the market closes so I know where about I would need to make the adjustment. And so I'll look at what, you know, I have a, uh, at the, for that trade, I'll have a delta trigger. So I know how much I need to cut the deltas. I, I actually cut quite a bit of delta out of the trade. It's, it's you know, 60% or higher. So I'll figure out a put that's close. And I typically will put the contingent order for the put, you know, plus 10 cents. So when the market gets to a certain price, it'll trigger to buy that put, and I'll have it buy the put, you know, at the mark plus ten cents. And I'm not saying that they all fill, but so far, every time I've done that, they've been filled. And if you're concerned, you know, put it for twenty cents, you'll get filled. And you know, the alerts go to my phone. 
I have an alert that goes to my phone when it gets hit, and then the confirmation of the order goes to the phone. So if I'm away, I could um, log in and manually force feed that put and just buy it. If I see that the alert got hit and I don't have a follow-up um, con order confirmation come through, then I can log in on my phone and just, because the order's already in and working, I can just change the price and make sure it works. And while I worked a job, I could only, I only had access to the computer for 45 minutes at lunch. So this is how I traded the original Jeep all the time, was buy a put, buy a call. And, you know, the next day at lunchtime, I would fix the trade the way it's supposed to be. Like on the calls, you know, if I bought a call, then the next day at noontime, I would sell that call and close the call spreads. And on the downside, I was just buying puts. That was my main adjustment strategy for the downside. Any other questions? Uh, Paul, maybe you have a, a minute to show any live positions just to see uh, uh See it in toss? Yeah. Well, I have to start toss. I have toss. <clears throat> I didn't even have it running this morning. Well, I had it running first thing. I had a order for a call go off on one of the trades. And, but other than that, it's been quiet. Do you ever overlap trades, or is it just put one on, close it, put the next one on? Uh, I actually... I had started doing that in the end of 2013, and, and going forward, I will be doing the same thing. So every week, um, I'll put one on. I have six on now, three in July and three in August. Um, let me, I have to end this. Problem is, I have to end the slideshow and start toss. How much time we got? And That's OK. We're on. almost out of time anyway. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I showed a couple of them on the Tuesday group, so you could take a look. But my plan going forward, um, the, the, the butterflies that I've trade um, have become very, very difficult to make money. So I've moved over to just trading these trades, the Jeeps. And I will usually, my plan is to run four of them a month. Okay, so if somebody's considering a trial in the future, there's never a bad time to start. That is correct. And Serge has popped up with a question. Uh, is the put bought when the IV is already spiked? It can be too pricey. Did you see that? Yeah, typically what I found is... Um, with this, the way this trade is set up and how quickly I adjust to the downside, um, I do not need to buy the put up front. Um, it, it is a drag on the trade. I did that on the Jeeps and probably would suggest it if you're trading multiples. You know, it depends on, upon how big a risk you're taking, naturally. Um, but yes, it does bring the, the theta to unacceptable low number because when you start looking at the data from um, hang on a second let me let's go back to this and this so when you look up here this logs in the put adjustments and you can see the trade you know this three and these are the call adjustments so typically most of the time it's you know, there's two call adjustments. You put the call on, you take the call off. And this one happened to be you do two upside, two upside adjustments here. But look at how many times that you're adjusting to the upside in 2016 versus the downside. So that, that put becomes a big drag on the performance of the trade. 
So I think something else that might actually be useful here, that's something I did with the weird door, and you probably would do as well, and that is to to keep up with your uh, delta to theta ratio and your delta to vega ratio. Uh, and of course, these are going to vary according to what the platform that you use, but uh, I always used to note what it was at the uh, trade launch, and then I had uh, certain uh, threshold points, you know, at which it would, uh, when one of the ratios got out of line, it would help the decision-making process for making an adjustment. And and if the adjustment was to add a debit spread, I think it's important for for everybody to know that depending on how you structure uh, the debit spread in terms of width and where you place it, uh, you know, in terms of distance from the money, you can either get more deltas or more vegas according to what you need. So if people aren't already familiar with uh, the Greeks of, of uh, debit spreads, I would encourage everybody to learn that. And uh, Paul and Jim, I know obviously uh, you guys know that and, and use that accordingly. Dan, I can't stress enough how important what you just said is. What ends up happening is that I know that some people just want to have nice, clean, simple rules. If my delta gets here, then do this. If this happens, then do that. But the problem is that depending on how high IV is and how steep the put skew becomes, that what you just said, that the price and the placement and the distance between strikes of that put uh, vertical is absolutely critical. Put it in the wrong place, and it's almost as bad as buying a put in, in buying a put by itself. Put it in the right place, and even if things end up moving against you or for you, you're going to end up having just a really um, uh, altered um, uh, risk reward ratio of that thing. And that's what that's what's so important. That's where all the skill comes in from the experience. Right. <clears throat> that and a lot of testing. Uh, I remember when we <laughs> yes. were first doing the Jeep, you know, I, I did a lot of back testing on debit spreads, you know, where to put right. them. Uh, right. And the other thing the I remember, Paul, were, we, if you put them here or there or, you know, during a market downturn, so which one would give you the best performance? Because, that, you know, it, it, these adjustments going down are, are to protect you know, we all look at the delta. We all look at the big, uh, the vega. Uh, we all look at the Greeks of the position. But in in reality, what it all boils down to is we're making adjustments to protect the P and L. That, that's so okay. right because we look at the Greeks, and I know that you do this, Paul, because we used to do it together. Not only do we look at the Greeks, but we look at where the Greeks are going to be if the market does, you know, moves down this much or up that much uh, you know you have you know looking at a snapshot of the Greeks is important but looking at, at and you do this all the time right you do this even I mean he, here's here's residue uh, of of how this is so ingrained into you anybody who's ever watched uh, Paul and you, you sat with him and to go through his spreadsheet of what skew is and the price of the butterflies not only does he do where the price of the butterflies are but he also does what happens if I Where's the price of the butterfly for the butterfly 10 points above and 10 points below, right? So we're always looking at how the Greeks will morph over time. Uh, I remember, it, uh, and this one I never forgot, when I asked once uh, um, about how come he had, uh, you know, was the scoring leader year after year. Wayne Gretzky once said, I don't skate to the puck. I skate to where the puck's going to be. We can't manage just to where our, our Greeks are now. We have to manage to where our Greeks and our P&L are going to be if. And that's where the skill comes into saying, well, if this happens, how can I end up making an adjustment that's, uh, hopefully, I'm going to lose money on my hedge, but if I lose money, I'm only going to lose a little bit. But if I do need that hedge, it's going to help to offset a big chunk of the loss that I would have incurred if I didn't do anything. Right. I think, you know, it goes beyond just fixing delta. I mean, you can fix delta and still lose, you know, lose money. The, the, the adjustment can has the possibility that it's not going to make any money. So, yes, you can fix your your 
deltas and your Greeks at that point in time, but as like on the downside. And as the market goes down, you find that I'm still losing money. I don't understand it mm-hmm. because that particular adjustment, fixed delta, but it wasn't going to make any money. Right. It fixed delta it in a snapshot, but it didn't end up helping you uh, with your gamma that your delta would continue to be fixed if it moved down another 5 or 10 or 20 points. Correct. Right. Or and it that, may have fixed the, the delta, but it's, you know, you buy a put and it's so far, uh, it's, it's down below where everybody feels the market's going to stop. So nobody else is buying that put. It's just you. So the, the, the um, pricing of that put doesn't go up the way it should. And you find that, well, that was, you know. Yeah, and here's why that's even a bigger problem today and why it takes even more skill today was because when we take a look at the way things are set up normally today, um, the put skew is steep. Now, now, all that means is that the puts far below the money are trading at a very, very high implied volatility. Sometimes, uh, you know, the at-the-money puts might be trading at a, you know, a 10 um, – uh, implied volatility, but the far below the money puts, okay, might be trading at a 22 implied volatility. So even if volatility spikes, as you get closer to the money, okay, with that, that, that uh, below the money put that you bought, its IV is not going to go up as much as you might think. And if you do your modeling and you say, well, what happens if volatility goes up by three points? That, that's kind of complete bullshit because what ends up happening is you're taking every single strike and increasing its volatility by 3%. And that's not going to happen. It's not going to go up uniformly. It's going to go up less for the far below the money puts that you bought, and you're going to think that you're safe and you're going to make money. And then when it bounces, you're going to end up getting absolutely killed on that long put. And even though your iron condor or your weirdo or your jeep, okay, ended up breaking even, okay, you lost a ton of money, okay, that month because the thing is that your hedge was so poor the way you put it on and took it off. Again, not that I'm, I'm speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, any anything else before we wrap it up, or uh, right on nope. a good good time to stop? Okay, that sounds fine. I'm all set. All right. Well, uh, appreciate everyone uh, sticking with us for the whole uh, presentation, and uh, feel free to join Paul at the the trial. I guess the uh, you got a possible jury duty, so I don't think you're going to have any trades until um, maybe a week or so. Yeah, week and a half. Probably, probably not. I have to go do my civic duty. Okay. Well, so can we do this, um, uh, um, Tom? Can we let everybody sign up for the trial whenever they want, but the clock won't start ticking until um, 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 the first, the first trade, trade is put on? Sure. Yeah, there's um, actually no no clock, so... We anticipate it'll end sometime in late July, but that's a, a moving target. So it depends on when Paul actually starts, and then we'll give everybody a good uh, three, four weeks. Okay, good. All right, so thanks, everyone. I'll uh, get this uh, recording posted with the links to sign up, and uh, I'll just put it in the chat one last time. Let's see. Deep trial. There it is. So if you haven't signed up, we have a, a few already, so that's good to see you. And uh, um, hopefully uh, Paul doesn't have to do jury duty and can get uh, the trades going on sooner rather than later. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thanks, everyone. Nice job, Paul. Thank you. Nice job, Paul. Thank you.